The world's most famous living atheist, Richard Dawkins, one of the four horsemen of the new atheist movement 20 years ago, is now calling himself a Christian. Sort of. Here's why. Well, I must say I was slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead. I do think that we we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm, I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. And so, you know, I, I love hymns and Christmas carols. And um, I, I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. Uh, it's true that statistically the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down. Uh, and I, I'm happy with that. But I would not be happy if... Um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Um, so I, I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter if we, certainly if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be tr truly dreadful. If I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I choose Christianity every single time. I mean, it seems to me to be a, a fundamentally decent religion um, in a way that I think Islam is not. I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith. For an intelligent guy, Richard Dawkins sure seems to miss some pretty basic aspects of life and logic. 20 years after creating the modern atheist movement, he is shocked and horrified by the inevitable consequences of his movement's success. The man holds multiple degrees from Oxford, where he went on to teach for many years. And yet, for all that education, Dawkins never seemed to learn the basic lesson known as F-A-F-O. Oh, that, that's the polite way of putting it. So for Professor Dawkins and anyone else who might have missed it, here's a refresher. All right, today we're going to talk about how we can find out and how much we can find out and what it takes to get there. So first we have to decide how much do we want to find out. Mm -hmm. So let's say in this case, I want to find out at a level of seven. Okay, so I find that level on my graph. It's on and I come biases. horizontally to my gradient line. Where it intersects with my gradient line, I'm going to come straight down to where it intersects with my f around line. Mm -hmm. That there is going to tell me how much I have to f around to find out what I need to find out. It's just see, as you can yeah. see... The more you f around, mm -hmm. the more you're going to find out. And also, if you stay down here and you never f around, you'll never find out. So I hope this lesson is helpful. Thank you. Very simple. Very helpful. I wish more people had learned that lesson and taken it to heart. But they didn't. And now we're all finding out that when you spend decades eradicating, or at least attempting to eradicate, the spirit that animated your entire civilization, that civilization is not liable to survive for very long. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. The president of Guyana just destroyed the BBC on climate change. I, you know, sometimes things take a little longer to make it from America to the rest of the world. So maybe, you know, six, seven, even 10 years ago now, it's these Shapiro destroys, even I say in all, all humility, Knowles destroys, Walsh, whoever, you know, with facts and logic. Well, now it's made it to Guyana, baby. And this president of Guyana totally destroyed the liberal journalists on climate change with facts and logic. We'll get to that in one moment. First, though, before we talk about that, we got to talk about Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles. Thanks to Biden inflation, 20 bucks barely gets you anything these days. You can't get a burger and fries for less than 20 bucks. How do you expect to fill up your gas tank? But you know what 20 bucks will get you from my cell phone company. I don't, not that I own the cell phone company, but I have the phone and the service. And it's called Pure Talk. For 20 bucks, you can get unlimited talk text and plenty of 5G data for just $20 a month. It's crazy. 
Pure Talk gives you the same quality of service as your current cell phone provider, but for half the cost. I want to make sure you heard that. Pure Talk is offering top-tier coverage on America's most dependable 5G network for half the cost of other carriers. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can switch to Pure Talk with the phone and phone number you currently use, or you can take advantage of their great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Making the switch is incredibly easy. Their U.S. customer service team can help you join Pure Talk in as little as 10 minutes. Choose to spend your hard-earned money with a wireless company that shares your values, supports our military and veterans, creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Don't spend another day spending ridiculous amounts of money on your cell phone plan. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles right now. Get an additional 50% off your first month. puretalk.com slash Knowles. Speaking of religion in politics, generally speaking, every time we bring up a story about religion and politics, it's kind of a downer. You know, that religion is on the decline. There's some scandal within the church. There's some lack of courage. It's, it's unfortunate. Today, we have some good news, which is that the Cardinal of Washington, D.C., Wilton Cardinal Gregory, who is known as a a rather liberal prelate, just went on CBS News, Face the Nation, and called out President Joe Biden for saying that he's a very devout Catholic while undermining important aspects, non-negotiable aspects of the Catholic faith. I would say that he's very sincere about his faith, but like a number of Catholics, he picks and chooses dimensions of the faith to highlight while ignoring or even contradicting other parts. There there is a phrase that uh, we have used in the past, a cafeteria Catholic. You choose that which is attractive and dismiss that which is challenging. Or, as Thomas Aquinas would say, you, you allow your conscience to guide you. <laughs> is, there, is there something on the menu he's not ordering, in your view, well, so I, to speak? Well, I, I would say there are things, especially in terms of the life issues, mm-hmm. there are things that he chooses to ignore, or he uses the... Uh, the current situation as a political pawn rather than saying, look, my church believes this. This is really, act- I know it seems, if maybe if you're not Catholic, if you're kind of looking at this from the outside, it seems as though Cardinal Gregory here is being very measured, even perhaps a bit restrained. This is a brutal a challenge to the president who who makes his Catholicism uh, an important aspect of his political persona. And Cardinal Gregory is basically saying, yeah, man, you are, you are contradicting very important elements of the faith. How dare you call yourself a practicing Catholic? You're, a, you're actually a cafeteria Catholic. That's a brutal phrase. Uh, I have to address that ridiculous Episcopalian priestess woman because it's so, I almost couldn't even pay attention to the rest of the clip where Cardinal Gregory is making this really important point in a very charitable way, but but he's still making it clear. And then this mouthy Episcopalian priestess lady, masquerading as a prelate, comes out and she says, well, you know, actually, maybe he's just going to let his conscience be his guide to quote St. Thomas Aquinas. Lady, you're quoting Jiminy Cricket. What are you talking about? Right, how dare you? Get... Get St. Thomas's name out your mouth. What are you, are you how dare you? <laughs> that is, I don't know where in the Summa uh, this woman, well, I don't know. I guess this woman, her reading of the Summa Theologiae must be a, a little bit uh, off base if she thinks that she can become a bishopress or whatever she's pretending to be. But but I don't know where she, she got that uh, actually the way to practice the faith is to just always let your conscience be your guide. But that's actually not, not how we do it. We also uh, submit to the authority of uh, the priests and the bishops and the Supreme Pontiff. We also uh, uh, submit our own sometimes defective wills to the magisterium, the deposit of faith, obviously sacred scripture. And you don't get to just make up your own religion, lady. But anyway, 
I digress. Sorry, gets me a little hot under the collar. And I'm not wearing a collar like this woman is inappropriately wearing. Uh, but, but then Cardinal Gregory, he kind of dismisses her ridiculous point. And then he says, look, I, I'm sure Biden is sincere. Maybe uh, he's trying to be sincere at least. But whatever he's doing, it's not Catholicism. This is not from some you know, right-wing bishop or something, which the media sometimes try to paint as being opposed to Pope Francis. Or No, this is a well-known and broadly reputed to be liberal bishop. And, and Biden's uh, devout Catholic shtick is running out. It's, uh, it's, it's played out. It, it, Biden tries to make that a key aspect of his campaign because he's trying to contrast himself with Trump. He says Trump is undignified. Trump is demeaning the office of the presidency. And and I, Joe Biden, I'm going to restore dignity to the Oval Office. I'm going to I'm going to make America good again. Okay, I'm going to America's back, baby. And what Gregory's saying is actually, man, you're you're promoting infanticide on a mass scale. You're doing all sorts of things that are really contrary to your faith. Don't, I guess you can pursue whatever you're going to pursue, but, but don't, don't try to pretend, don't try to slap this patina of moral legitimacy on it because it ain't really there. Biden, I think now is indisputably very far afield of the Catholic faith, which, which even moderately attentive observers already knew. Biden's real faith is liberalism, and a man cannot serve two masters. So when when the two don't seem to conflict, he can pretend to be a practicing Catholic. But when they do conflict, he's a liberal on questions of life, on questions of human nature, on questions of marriage, on all sorts of questions. He when whenever there's a conflict between the two faiths that he uh, is is inclined to to profess. He's going to choose liberalism. So, so how's he going to win over votes? If he's even losing the relatively liberal prelates of his own church, how's he going to win over votes? He's going to try to win over Nikki Haley supporters. He's just run a big ad seeking support from the angry, disappointed Haley voters. Bird brain. I call it bird brain. Nikki Haley has made an unholy alliance with rhinos, never Trumpers, Americans for no prosperity. She's sitting there like... She's gone crazy. She's a very angry person. She is not presidential timber. I don't need votes. We voted for Haley. Trump doesn't want your vote. He is. She's gone haywire. There aren't that many never Trumpers anymore. How do you bring these Nikki Haley voters back into the town? I'm not sure we need too many. Save America. Join us, Biden-Harris. So this is not some super PAC. This is paid for by Biden for president, a direct appeal to the Haley voters. This is a part of the campaign strategy, which we'll get to in one second. First, though, when we want to talk about your business strategy, we got to talk about ramp. Go to ramp.com slash Knowles. When you're running a business, time is money, honey. That's why you need ramp. If you're a finance professional looking for a better way to maximize productivity and cut wasteful spending, then ramp could be for you. Ramp is the corporate card and spend management software designed to help you save time and put money back in your pocket. With Ramp, you can issue cards to every employee with limits and restrictions, automate expense reporting, and stop wasting time at the end of every month. Ramp's accounting software automatically collects receipts and categorizes your expenses in real time so you don't have to. You will never have to chase down a receipt ever again. Your employees will no longer spend hours submitting expense reports. The time you will save each month on employee expenses will allow you to close your books eight times faster. Ramp is so easy to use, whether you have five employees or 5,000, you can get started in less than 15 minutes. Get 250 bucks when you join Ramp. Go to ramp.com slash Knowles, Canada, W-L-A-S. That is spelled R-A-M-P dot com slash Knowles, Canada, W-L-A-S. Ramp.com slash Knowles. Cards issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank members, FDIC. Terms and conditions apply. What is this about? The shallow interpretation of this is going to be that this is about Biden appealing to the moderates, appealing to the centrists. This isn't really about moderation, though. This is about anti-Trump. That's what it's really about. It's... 
Donald Trump has done a pretty good job of bringing in people who have moderate positions. The, the moderate position on, say, entitlement reform, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, is currently held by Trump. It was not held by Nikki Haley. It was not held by people like Paul Ryan. It was not held by the Tea Party, for instance. Trump has a much more moderate position on entitlements, the biggest driver of the debt and deficit. Joe Biden has a kind of extreme view on entitlements, which is just keep running them up. Joe Biden, or or Donald Trump rather, is saying that we're not going to cut any of these entitlements, but we're going to try to get budget cuts elsewhere. And I'm not weighing in on the merits of that as as public policy. I'm just pointing out Trump has the moderate position there. When it comes to things like foreign policy, Trump has a relatively moderate position. Other people in the uh, Republican Party, not naming names, he said, but other people seem a lot more hawkish, a lot more willing to just use military force and bomb everyone all over the world. Democrats alternately want to invade countries. You think of the Hillary Clinton set, which never found a country they didn't want to invade. Or they're the the radical, you know, don't ever use military force ever, give peace a chance, kumbaya stuff. Donald Trump's foreign policy is sometimes use military force, sometimes don't. Speak softly, carry a big stick, or speak loudly and don't wield the big stick, but be a little bit unpredictable. And and so one day we're going to drop the Moab, one day we're going to kill the top Iranian general, The next day, we're going to refuse to go to war. We're going to draw down some troops. We're going to decrease the tensions. We're going to try diplomacy with North Korea, for instance. Trump has the moderate views. And I know the M word is a a bad word, but moderation is a virtue. You You don't want an incoherent policy, which a lot of people in the Republican and Democrat camps have, but you want, you want, some degree of moderation. Moderation is a virtue. Trump has that. What this is really about is not about Biden agreeing with Nikki Haley on any particular uh, political issue. It's about both of them hating Trump. I'm not even saying the individuals. I'm saying the voters for both camps. They, they hate Trump. So come on over here. Join us. Sure, you're a lifelong Republican. You hate everything Joe Biden stands for, but you you supported Nikki Haley. She lost. You really hate Donald Trump. Okay, vote for us to get revenge. That's what this is. This appeal is about, and that's really what the whole Biden campaign is about. Because there's nothing he can campaign on. He can't campaign on foreign policy. He can't campaign on immigration. He can't campaign on the economy. He can't campaign on anything. It's all it's all just fallen apart. It's turned to ash. Everything the man has touched. So it's got to be anti-Trump. And so naturally, you would make the appeal to the faction of the GOP that really, really hates Trump. And you're not, you're not going to make it. Notice there, there, there was no issue in that campaign ad. It wasn't, hey, if you agree with us on uh, occupational licensing reform, well, then you should come on over here. We share your views. No, it was just, hey, that guy, that Trump guy, he hates you. Yeah, he hates you. And we hate him. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> he's bad. Anyway, come over. So we're on the same team, right? <laughs> issues, what, who cares about issues? We just hate that orange guy. And, and if I were the Biden campaign, I'd probably be running the exact same ad because it's, it's sad, but it's probably the best they've got. Now, speaking of Trump, Trump is wealthy again. Remember a week or two ago, the libs said that Trump was broke. It was trending all over social media. Trump is broke. He can't even pay the half billion dollar civil judgment that we've unjustly levied against him for no reason at all. Ha ha, he's totally broke. No one on earth, by the way, could pay that in cash. million civil fraud judgment for total cooked up nonsense. But they said, oh, Trump is broke. He's broke. Well, per a new report from Bloomberg, Trump is back up among the 500 wealthiest people on the planet. Why is that? That's because his new Trump media group, after the acquisition of Truth Social, uh, trading as DJT on the NASDAQ, uh, jumped up and boosted his net worth by billions of dollars. Now, you probably saw the headlines, if you search this sort of thing, yesterday, that actually Trump's stock plummeted. Oh, it plummeted, all right. And it, in a way, it did. It launched at a very, very high price, and it's, it's volatile in the first few days after it went public. But I checked yesterday evening. The DJT stock was still trading at something like $45 a share, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. 
the, the real sophisticated financial analysts were expecting this thing to debut at like $14 a share. And it, it in, in early trading, it, it was in the 40s, then it jumped into the 50s. At one point, I think it peaked around $71, $72. Then it fell a little bit down to $66 or so. dollars. Now, as of last night, it was, it was back down at $45 or thereabouts. That's still unbelievable. It's just amazing. And it, it's, it's yet another example of this guy pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Now, of course, he's, he still will face a cash crunch if the, if the New York civil fraud case uh, demands that he pay up a bunch of cash, a bunch of extortion payments to the New York attorney general. But, but in any case, it seems to me that this whole episode, which would have destroyed any other political candidate, this, any, any one of the prosecutions or the, the civil case would, or the other civil case. Remember, there was the other civil case with the gossip columnist lady who said that Trump ravished her in a Bergdorf Goodman dressing room 55 years ago or whatever, 30 years ago. Uh, any one of those cases would have destroyed any ordinary political candidate. And so I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to seem like I'm giving undue adulation to Trump here. I don't think it's undue. I'm pointing out the man can make $3 billion in one day and then lose a billion dollars and then go and then be threatened with 700 years in prison and then be charged half a billion dollars and then have that reduced to $150 million. And, and he just keeps on keeping on. We are talking about a presidential candidate who is playing at a level of public life that we are largely not familiar with in America. We, whether you love him or hate him, the man might be a world historic figure. <laughs> okay? He is at, at the very least an American historic figure. We have not seen anything like him. And so all of the analysis, well, actually, you know, this other senator or governor, he actually would be better at this thing. And if only we had realized that, and here's what the Democrat playbook should be based on past races. No, that stuff is out the window. (laughs) That is all out the window. We are dealing with simply a different kind of beast. That is how he was able to take over the Republican Party on a whim, having never held public office before. And that is why he cannot be dislodged from the leadership of one of the two big parties in the United States. You know, the Daily Wire's best-selling party game and its conspiracy expansion pack are available now at dailywire.com slash shop. But that's not all. The full uncensored library of yes or no episodes is now available exclusively for subscribers on dailywire.com. Like my episode with my friend, Spencer Clavin, which had several questions removed on certain big tech platforms. Take a look. Skipping leg day is a lot like attending... (laughs) It's a lot like attending a liberal arts college (laughs) and staying committed to your cheating girlfriend. In both cases, you are throwing your life away while also acting like a butter soft simp who just hopes things will work themselves out. (laughs) Who writes those questions? I think it's Mr. Davies, actually, is the end. A few other people around the office contribute. Butter soft simp. Bundle the classic yes or no game and the conspiracy expansion pack featuring over 110 new cards today. Visit dailywire.com slash shop to get yours before they're gone. Speaking of presidents, this is the one to clip. This is the one that's going to go viral on TikTok. And the, who's the new viral star? It's not some hot new 22-year-old female influencer or something. It's the president of Guyana who just destroyed the BBC with facts and logic. According to many experts, more than 2 billion tons of carbon emissions will come from your seabed, from those reserves, and be released into the atmosphere. I I don't know if you as a head of state went to the COP in Dubai. Let me stop you right there. Do you know that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined? A forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon? A forest that we have kept alive 
a forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, Does no, that no, no, give no, you I, the that, right that, to release that, that all of this right? carbon? Does from that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change <laughs> because we have kept this forest alive that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that you enjoy that the world enjoy, that you don't pay us for, that you don't value, that you don't see a value in, that the people of Ghana has kept alive. Are you in the pockets of those who have damaged the environment? Are you in the pockets, are you and your system in the pockets of those who destroyed the environment through the industrial revolution and now lecturing us? Are you in their pockets? Are you paid by them? He, go, he keeps just going at this guy. The BBC doesn't have very much to say, but it's an important point that he's making. He's saying, hold on. You Brits, you are after, what, a century and a half, two centuries of industrialization, well, about a century and a half, I guess, of, of industrialization, spewing pollution into the atmosphere. You are now, you've, you've woken up after this has led to a lot of wealth and material prosperity for your country. You have decided, okay, actually, now that we got our bag, this is kind of bad for the environment. So we're going to tell all the poor countries that are developing right now and that are beginning to see the fruits of that material prosperity, we're going to tell them to stop because we got ours and now we don't, we don't want all that pollution. And, and Mr. Guyana over here says, hold on, <laughs> we have a forest, just one forest that is bigger than your country and Scotland. So a large, large portion of the whole United Kingdom combined we could, we could start using those resources. We could start spewing carbon into the atmosphere. And we don't. We don't do that. We, we do more to conserve the natural environment without any thanks, without being told to by you, than you guys have ever done. But what we want is a little bit of economic development. You're telling us, no, now we can't. And think about how offensive that is at, at an even more basic level. What the people in Guyana, just like, like uh, the people in India in, in particular, India now the most populous country in the world, and a lot of the West is, is telling India not to develop because this could be bad for Mother Gaia and the sun monster might, you know, send more harmful rays at us if, if the Indians continue to develop. Well, what, what these nations are saying is, hold on, we, we have people here. Forget about the Delta smelt for a second. Forget about the sun monster, you know, melting the ice caps, which isn't even really happening. Uh, we have people here who are hungry, who want to feed their families, who want to flourish. And you're telling us that your abstract concern for the polar bears in the Arctic on the other side of the world is more important than the immediate concern that we have and the responsibility we have to provide for our people. Your, your fantasies about unconscious life on the other side of the world is more important to you than our people. How deeply offensive is that? But it's the natural consequence of a kind of environmental cult, which, which upends the way that we traditionally understand the natural order, which is that Human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. We know this not merely through revelation, but through reason. We are the rational animal. We have rational souls. We can, we can even think about things like abstract justice or the Delta smelt on the other side of the world. And because of that, we bear a resemblance to the creator of the universe. We share in intelligence, and the world is intelligible to us. And we are therefore stewards. We have a responsibility for the irrational parts of the created world. And so we try to take care of these things, but we do it in large part for us, not because the Delta smelt have some abstract rights. What these guys say, the, the environmentalists say, is no. Actually, we are lower than the smelt. Actually, we are lower than the polar bears. We're not rational at all. We live to serve the rocks and Mother Gaia and the sun monster. And if that means that some, some people in Guyana aren't able to feed their families, well, too bad. If that means that Indians are going to have to die of starvation, well, you know, that's, we're just going to have to do that because we want to make sure that the polar bears have a bigger ice float. 
Even though the ice isn't necessarily really melting where the pole, it, anyway, it does, not, doesn't matter. We're just, does that sound good to you? And the Guyana guy is looking there. He says, have you lost your freaking mind? It actually ties in with what you're talking about at the top of the show, which is uh, Richard Dawkins. These people, specifically the Brits, I guess, in this case, I don't want to be too harsh to the motherland, but they, they, they've thrown out the religion that built our whole civilization. It's, they've done worse than throw it out. They've inverted it. They've, they've turned it into some bizarro kind of cult of, of the self, but then not even the self. You know, it's not even just pure selfishness. It's kind of a, an abolition of the self, which, which could be expected because when man finds his identity in the source and summit of all being in God, then he knows who he is. We know where we fit in with things. When we just make an idol out of ourselves, we, we abolish humanity. We, we lose our connection to the source and summit of all being. And so then what? And we say, oh, we're worse than, we're worse than the smelt. We're worse than the rocks. We don't matter at all. And, 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 and then we lose, as Richard Dawkins fears, the cathedrals. We lose the parishes. We lose political sovereignty. We lose, we lose our charity for our fellow men. And we tell the, the people in Guyana, go, sorry, you're going to have to starve for some reason. Why? Why? They can't, the BBC can't quite explain it. They just feel like any bizarro pagan tribe, they fear the reprisals of the sun gods. I wonder if the new atheists saw that. I know they didn't see that coming. Obviously, they're lamenting now the logical and inevitable consequences of their own quasi-intellectual movement. Very, very unfortunate. Speaking of Western pathologies, new study out. You don't really need a study for this for this news story, but uh, it turns out that loneliness is on the rise. This research, according to one poll commissioned by Zumba, polled the, the Brits again. I don't know why the Brits are so in the news this, this week. Found that 40% have gone at least three days without a face-to-face conversation with another person. 28%. This is even worse. So 40% go three days without a face-to-face interaction with another person. That is horrifying. I guess the, the one consolation here is if this has happened to you, you're not alone. <laughs> you are alone, and that's the problem that you're dealing with. But you are not alone in your loneliness. 40% of two in five people have, have experienced the same thing. But then this is even more distressing. 28% of people report feeling lonely while at a social event. 25% of people feel isolated in their workplace. This pains me. Nothing... I'm, I'm going to reveal myself. I know you think I'm a big, tough guy. I'm going to reveal a little bit of how I can become a softie. It really pains me when people are lonely, when they feel alienated and alone. It just, I don't, it just call me soft, but it really bothers me. And a, around one in four people now report feeling that way when they're at a social event, when they're in their office, which is the social event that they're at every single day. They, they feel, even though they're around people, they still feel alone. And then 40% of people go three days without seeing anyone face to face. How did this happen? I frequently mention a, a fundamental error in liberal modernity on this show. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I mention it so frequently because it's not just mamby pamby stuff, it, it has very practical consequences. I say that. The fundamental error, among the fundamental errors of liberal modernity, is that we have decided that that people are basically individuals, which is not true. Our, Our real identity is not as individuals. It is as the social creature, the political animal. It's the difference between Enlightenment liberalism and classical political philosophy. And where the two disagree, the Enlightenment liberals are wrong, always. (laughs) And and the classical political philosophers are right. Not to oversimplify it too much, but especially on this point, is man fundamentally just an atom floating in outer space, or is man a social creature? The left and the right in modern liberal life say that we're individuals. And the left expresses this through their embrace of weird sex stuff and the defense of killing babies and just doing whatever you want, uh, you know, to pursue your own will. 
regardless of of the moral reality to it. And but but the right feels this way too when it comes to money. You know, we don't. I don't. I don't owe you my money. I'm not my brother's keeper. I'm not. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm an individual. We're not. We're not. Your identity comes from the first community that you're born into, which is your family. You you your identity. It, it would be unthinkable to even say that you have an identity outside of your family. That's where you get your name. It's where you get your behaviors. It's where you get your patterns of speech. You just imitate it Mom, from mama and dada. It's where you even get your desires. We, we sometimes mention Rene Girard and the mimetic theory of desire, that, that your very desires come from imitation of the other people. And the first people you imitate are, are that first community that you're born into. And then your neighborhood, and then your schools, and then your churches. And that's where it comes from, okay? So in liberal modernity, because we deny this, it has very practical political consequences. We engage in public policies. We, we, we enact policies that diminish the family, that define the family out of existence, that take away protections that would support the family, that, that divvy people up in society. We encourage expressive individuality. Uh, we encourage uh, a political order that, that speaks primarily of rights and entitlement rather than obligations and duties that we have one to another. We, we deny any kind of uh, common good or communal endeavors that we engage in. This wasn't always the case. We still had a sense of community even 50 years ago, but, but that has seriously eroded. And the, the upshot of all of it is not just some abstract political philosophy. The upshot of all of it is that 40% of people now go three days without seeing people face to face. That is bad. It's bad for them. It makes people very unhappy. We think that, that we can just live our lives and do our jobs on computers. Our relationships can be mediated by screens. We don't need to get married. We don't need to have children. We don't need to see one another. We don't need to go to family reunions. We but we do. We do. And if you don't do that, you're going to be really miserable and sad. And then, this is the scariest part, even when you do come together, you're not going to know how to relate to one another. So you're going to come together and then one in four people at a party is going to feel alone. One in four people at their office, surrounded by people, you're still going to feel alone because you, you've allowed the muscles of, of your social nature, which is, so, which is essential to your, your nature as a human being, you've allowed those muscles to atrophy. You won't even know how to do it when you are melded up together and you will continue to be unhappy. I, you know, Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? It's an important lesson to take to heart. It has very practical, uh, deleterious effects on, on your life. And you need to take very practical steps. You need to make a point to see people in person. You need to show up to that family reunion. You need to date and get married. You need to have children if you can have children. You need to, if, if you are single, if you're celibate, if you're, you need to make sure that you are around other people and engaged in their lives. You have to make an effort to do that or you will be miserable even, even when you, you try to uh, create the simulation of social life. You won't be able to do it. Bent Key, speaking of raising kids, Bent Key is the brand new kids entertainment app from The Daily Wire. It's available now on Roku, Samsung, Fire TV, Apple TV, Android TV, and more coming soon. Best of all, you can try it for 14 days absolutely free. With Bent Key, there's no more worrying about inappropriate content or hidden agendas being pushed into kids' programming. You only get high-quality shows made for your kids that align with your family's beliefs. Do you need another reason to start your trial now? Well, Bent Key's most popular show, Chip Chilla, returns for season two this Saturday. Try Bent Key for free with our 14-day trial. No strings attached, no hidden fees, just incredible shows that your kids will actually love and you can trust. How do I know this? Because I let my kids watch it, and they Love it. Unlock the magic of Bent Key for your kids today. Head over to bentkey.com. Use code UNLOCK. Get 14 days of unlimited access to a world of adventure. Your kids deserve it. You deserve the peace of mind. My favorite comment yesterday is from Ekis25. I'm 67. My wife is still beautiful, grumpy, but beautiful. I love that. That's in response to Jolene, I think, where we say, you know, over time, your wife is, uh, is going to have a harder time physically competing with young little hot Jolene, which is why the Dolly Parton version of Jolene is a good song and the Beyonce girl boss version of Jolene is a bad song. But the point you've made is very important, which is 
if you grow with your wife, you're going to fall more and more in love with your wife. Even though it is objectively the case that she will be less physically hot, that is an undeniable fact, you will still find her beautiful because uh, there is more to attraction than merely physical beauty. Now, because I'm still young, my wife is still young and uh, both physically and spiritually very hot. Um, I don't need to worry about that. But there are so many other aspects, even beyond that, you know, sweet little Elise is a hot little tamale. Uh, this morning, I'll give you an example. I wake up, it's a Tuesday morning. I sit down to breakfast. I have homemade sourdough waffles, nice thick little Belgian waffles, and a nice beautiful omelet. And there's strawberries and syrup on my waffle. And there's nice little sausage links with my espresso cup. And I think this is a Tuesday. There are people in their lives, they don't get a breakfast like this. In their lives, on the nicest Sunday brunch they've ever gone to, they don't get a breakfast like this. I get it on a Tuesday in the middle of the week. That, that kind of thing. Even if Elisa weren't a hot little, you know, hot to trot little nice looking lady. Eat just that. How does one resist but fall completely in love? I, don't, I don't, can't imagine. Now, speaking of social alienation, there is a new identity group that has just dropped. A new victim group. You know, we. <laughs> it started out, it was the racial groups. And then it was the sexual groups. And then it started to get like really weird with the sexual groups. It wasn't even just, you know, a guy who's light in the loafers or a lady who plays softball or something. It was a, a man who thinks that he's a woman. And then it became, and then they started to try to normalize pedos, remember, with the minor attracted persons. And there was that professor who, was, who went viral for, for uh, trying to normalize this. And then, well, now we've just gone all the way and there is an effort to normalize sociopaths, like actual just sociopaths. Uh, I, I, I read an article by this woman in the Wall Street Journal on the show a few weeks ago. It was, re it was really quite interesting. Well, she's got a book that she's releasing and she has gone viral on TikTok uh, for explaining the plight of the psychopaths. Hi, my name is Patrick Gagne and I'm here to talk to you about my book, Sociopath. In the last 20 years, sociopathy is believed to have doubled particularly among adolescents. And considering how little testing is available for this personality type, there's no way that that number isn't much, much higher. I'm trying to teach people what sociopathy is and isn't because I'm talking about a really complicated subject that doesn't have to be complicated. There are a lot of facts and research behind this personality type. And I found that taking that research and wrapping it up in a personal story allows people to digest it. I might well read this book. It seems kind of interesting, but I don't know that I don't know that we need to make sociopaths the new victim group. I don't. That seems it's the logical conclusion of the victim politics. But I, I don't. What is a sociopath? What's a psychopath? The terms are often used interchangeably. Some people will pedantically try to find a distinction between the two. I've never been able to discover one. It's people who don't really have feelings. You know, they don't. They can harm other people and they, they don't feel remorse for that. And she writes about this in her essay, presumably in her book as well. There's a lot of diversity in this fallen world. I'm not surprised that uh, this group exists and has always existed, this, this pathology in, in psychology. What is concerning, though, is what this, she insinuates at the top, which is that it's not just that sociopathy exists, but it's on the rise. It's underestimated. It seems to be more pronounced. Now, why is that? Well, I, I know that uh, we're not allowed to suggest that um, people's personality types or their desires or their feelings are in any way changeable or mutable. If we are to suggest that now, it's called conversion therapy or whatever. It's very, very bad. But obviously it's the case. I mean, when you have something like 30% of Gen Z now identifying as LGBTQ, then either there's something in the water turning the frogs gay or uh, these desires and identities are somewhat mutable. There's, some, they're, 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 there's a social fad aspect to it. One wonders if sociopathy is changeable too. In an age that is more charitable, that recognizes community, that recognizes that man is 
social and that is more sociable, I would strongly suspect that uh, degrees of, of sociopathy would be suppressed. And in an age such as ours, where everybody's pretty much Patrick Bateman, we're living in the American psycho stage of history, probably sociopathy is going to be a little bit more pronounced. So what do we do? Do we need to go out there and say, we need to protect sociopaths' rights? <laughs> you know, we need a sociopath day of visibility <laughs> where we can feed cats to ATM machines or something. Uh, no. We're, this is the, in honor of sociopath visibility day. We're going to play Huey Lewis in the news on no. Or do we, do we need to say that there's a problem, a little bit of a social or an antisocial contagion, and we're going to try to fix it? through our culture, and through our political order. We're going we're gonna to try to make a political order that's a little less antisocial, that's a little bit less alienated. Uh, people from other people, maybe people from their own bodies and their own identities, and we're, gonna, we're going to uh, order the n- necessary, inevitable pressure valves of society and politics. We're going to order them toward good and healthy things, rather than as they are presently ordered, toward really unhealthy things that are making sociopaths of us all. You might notice uh, uh, an implicit connection there to the... Okay, it's Tuesday. It's Tee Tuesday. The rest of the show continues. Now, you do not want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada WLES, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans.